Hey friends, welcome back to a new episode with Revit, the export from Revit to IFC with Dion. And today we have a special guest, Leila, who is also very passionate about BIM and who is working at Autodesk and who also has a YouTube channel where uh, she actually has a very popular series of exactly about that topic, how to export from Revit to IFC. Hi, Laila. <laughs> it's so nice to finally meet you. Please tell us a few words about yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm really glad to be here. Peter and I planned this for quite a while, but somehow we never managed it. So I'm uh, really happy we managed it today. I am an architect um, by trade, and um, I got very fascinated by BIM and the computers quite early, and um, that's why I developed more into a role of a BIM specialist and also a Revit specialist. And um, you might already know my YouTube channel. It was quite silent there since April last year, I think. And you may wonder where have I been? So. Um, I was trying to figure out the shared coordinates of Revit. <laughs> so, no, it's been a busy time, but I'm already working on some uh, new videos for the channel. I just came back from the AU. I'm wearing this super fancy AU 2022 speaker shirt for you today. And yeah, I'm really very much looking forward to this discussion today. I'm always fond of learning new things and I am representing the whole IFC topic from a very user perspective side so I'm I am very software related so I don't really can understand many things from the developer side because obviously I am a user I am an architect I'm not a developer that's why I'm really curious to see Dion's uh, views today and to hear a little bit about his approach on this really very challenging topic and of course I'm also a big uh, fan of your video series so thank yeah. you <laughs> Thanks for having me here. It's very, very nice. Dion, tell us a bit what we are going to do today. Hey everyone, my name is Dion. We're going to pick up where we left off on the previous video on uh, basic project setup. And now we're going to focus on the topic of geolocation. And geolocation has been covered again and again and again. So we're going to cover it one more time. And we're going to do the usual thing where we get some data out of Revit. We go through and see what it looks like in IFC, what's right, what's wrong put it back into Revit and keep on going back and forth a few times until things look great. And along that journey, we'll learn a few things about what certain config settings do and things to watch out for. And in particular, we're gonna look at what you need to do on a natural project even before you get involved in geolocation. So forget software, forget IFC, data schemas and all that, just what's important from the perspective of the guy setting up the project? What's important to the surveyor? What's important to the architect? What information do you actually need? And only once you have that information, then how do you set it up using the software and the IFC and the so on? That sounds very, very interesting and as it's supposed to be. So please share your screen and show us the truth. So before I set up today, I just want to share that we're going to do a similar thing to the previous videos and that we're going to show that you don't need the very latest and greatest of Revit to get things done. Things do work in older versions of Revit as well. So I've got three versions of Revit up. I've got 2022. 21 and I have 2020 hiding somewhere. The primary one we're going to be focusing on is on 2021. And this is all assuming that you follow the first video where you have the latest IFC export add-ins installed. So assuming you've done that, let's go right into it. And let's just happen, let's just say you've just exported it. You haven't done anything fancy here. Whoops, sorry, I'll delete that, make sure that didn't happen. Let's set that back to all the default settings. This is how it should look like. This should be cleared and that, that typically, I think by default is set to shared coordinates and we'll load that up in Blender. So here's the IFC model. And the best way to check here is firstly, you check it's IFC4. If anybody tells you they've geolocated something in 2X3, they're probably lying. It's technically possible with a workaround, but there's no real native way to do that. And we'll talk about that in a bit. And we'll jump down to the IFC geometry panel and look at georeferencing. And what you'll see here is that actually, look at that. I think we found the new bug hey, in Revit. <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't name for that to happen. Let's try with a really fresh project here. And what I was expecting to see is some georeferencing data in there. Actually, I'll show you 2x3 first. So what you'll see for 2x3, if you load it up, 
is that it will say not georeferenced, and that's just the end of the story for 2x3. But if you did export that as an IFC4, so we're going to go over here, we're going to choose the design transfer view setup. This is the default, what I was aiming for before. You can see that set to shared coordinates, and this is blank, and you'll see nothing here as well. No Eastings, no Northings, no nothing. So in theory, you might be thinking, hey, there's no georeferencing information, and let's see what actually happens. And what you'll see here, if we go back to georeferencing, is that there is some information. And in particular, you'll see this name that says something very funny. It says EPSG3857 and a whole bunch of funny numbers after it that look like coordinates. So we're gonna take a break here. I'm gonna explain what these two things are. And in georeferencing, you need two things. You need a coordinate reference system or what we call CRS and a set of coordinates and you need both of them to be correct. You, if you have a bunch of coordinates with no coordinate reference system, the coordinates are meaningless. Likewise, the other way around, if you have a coordinate reference system, but the coordinates are wrong or empty or missing, it's also meaningless. You need both together for meaningful geolocation. For those who don't know what a coordinate reference system is, the idea is that anywhere in the world, a surveyor will use a system, will have to define a coordinate system for your project. And there's a whole list of them out there and there's a registry by the EPSG which is I'm going to get this wrong European Pet Petroleum something and gas or something group and they've got a, a registry of all these coordinate systems around the entire world and so they have a code that looks like that and in Australia the common coordinate reference system used on projects is known as GDA 2020 MGA zone 56 now that's quite a mouthful and what happens is that rather than saying the entire thing you Georeferencing is referenced using a special short code uh, called this EPSG code for uh, most projects. Of course, there are some specialty projects which have a custom coordinate system, but for most projects, uh, you'll have a coordinate reference system. So if we specify no coordinate reference system, what is this? What is this 3857 number? And the answer is, is that that's actually the coordinate code for WGS84, and if that also means nothing to you, hopefully this will help. Uh, if you go into Google Maps or you go to OpenStreetMaps, your favorite map program, and you take a look at the Opera House, because what else would you do on Google Maps? What you see on the screen uses the coordinate system of WGS84, which is the, the human name for the EPSG code of 3857, so same on uh, Google Maps. So that's what it defaults to. And so, you know, that default is most likely wrong for your project. Your surveyor is most likely not going to be using WGS84 as the coordinate system for your project. So that's the first piece of information you've got to ask your surveyor. Forget coordinates east and north. Even before you ask him that, you say, hey, Mr. Surveyor, please tell us two things. What's the coordinate system we have to use? And they'll know what it is. Don't worry, if you're an architect and you're not sure what they are, that's okay, you, you don't need to know. It's the surveyor's job to know that, but it's the architect's responsibility to be aware that they have to ask the surveyor and they'll get that. And then you also have to remember to ask the surveyor, what's the EPSG code for that? And there are all sorts of websites online. You can double check this. So for example, epsg.io is a nice little one. If I search for MGA zone 56, which is what you typically use in Australia, you can see there's two options. One, which is EPSG 7856. The other one is 28356. Layla is probably listening in. I'm sorry, Layla, where are you in the world again? I'm in Germany, in Munich. Okay, I don't know the Munich coordinate systems, but I assume you do. <laughs> I'm, I'm an architect. I'm always struggling, uh, to be honest, with these coordinate system names. So the workflow I really like uh, most for setting up the coordinates in Revit is really taking the uh, civil 3D file from the surveyor where the coordinate system is already mapped and just acquiring the coordinates with Revit. And that will really pull the name and the coordinates and everything for you into Revit, so you don't need to worry about that anymore. Fantastic. That, that's a really cool trick. So that will fill out all of this stuff correctly, yeah. as well as the EPSG code, supposedly. So I guess if you didn't have that, you can do it manually. And now you understand yeah. the guts under the hood of, you can see that we've just entered in that. Revit has automatically done the lookup, which saves you the trouble of spelling it wrong. 
and, and that's an excellent feature. You just press OK. Can you try to put in my code to see what is happening? I'm just curious. Yeah, absolutely. What's your code, Petra? ETRS89. We have it in the requirements, so that's why it's easy. <laughs> so that's one? ETRS. ETR, R from Romania, oh, 89, without any spaces. Uh -huh. Okay, so I'm not sure which one of these it is. It will have to be a surveyor who will have to tell you. Yeah, it should be the one above. Why not? Well, I'm not a surveyor <laughs> and I don't understand <laughs> okay, Look, we can enter it in and see what Rabbit says. Yeah. Uh, it didn't like that one. So, uh... Maybe you need to say reset first. Maybe. Let's see. 4937. No, it just keeps on disappearing. Let's try the other one. 4258. Okay, that one has stayed, but it hasn't pulled up information. Yeah. Maybe it's best to speak to a surveyor. Yeah, um, okay, no problem. Okay, so for this example, I'm gonna use the one I know works, which is the Australian one. And I also want to highlight that the reason this is so important is because you can see that if I search for MGA zone 56, it's actually just like that one, there were multiple results. And in Australia, it's particularly important because we're in a sort of transition Point, where depending on when your project started and when you got your survey, you could either be using this one or this one. You can see in 2020, things started changing. So it's critical that you get that correct. And I have seen a project move between two different coordinate reference systems in the lifespan of the project, and that can actually make quite a big difference. Anywho, so we've got the first bit correct, the coordinate reference system. And so we've brought that in. And what we expect to see here, if we go to georeferencing, is the right EPSG code. And that's a great start. So now we'll start talking about the rest of the stuff, all these Eastings and Northings and funny words like abscissa and ordinate. And um, later on, we'll talk about scale as well, which is often confused. So I guess the next thing we want to focus on is the Eastings and Northings. We'll talk about rotation and scale later. We'll just start with the transformation aspects of geolocation. So an architect might design a building and he'll design it just like this. He'll say, okay, this is the shape of my building. And I'm going to point, uh, say the set out starts at this bottom left corner, maybe at a grid intersection or something, or a part of a site boundary offset or something like that. And he's going to say, this is how I want to set up my building. And he's going to draw it orthogonally to Project North, because that's how designers work. And notice that in this story that I'm portraying here, I'm talking about vertical construction. I'm talking about buildings. I'm not talking about roads, rail, power infrastructure. That is a separate story when it comes to georeferencing. And I'll explain why shortly. Architects are not trained in how surveying works. They work using a local coordinate system. And as a result, architects don't actually care about the easting and northing. That's a little detail that the surveyor has to work out to put it in the right spot on Earth, and nowadays in the BIM world, to get your models to line up. But the architect is more interested in the design, which is has a clear project X, a project Y, or you can call it project north, and that's what the architect cares about. Whereas a horizontal construction project doing roads and rail they work directly in Eastings and Northings. You know, that's how civil, the civil trade and the surveying trade thinks of the entire world. They think in terms of Eastings and Northings. And so a BIM project that's a horizontal job where your primary people are surveyors and civil disciplines and in-ground services, those types of roles means that the project would be working directly using what we call map coordinates, using directly the eastings and northings of the coordinate reference system. Whereas for smaller scale projects, as in physically smaller, a vertical construction, like a building, for example, the primary disciplines, which are the architects, the structural engineer, the fiber so, fire, uh, electrical, mechanical, hydraulic, and so on, they would all be using local engineering coordinates. And so these are usually small coordinates and there's a clear definition of a project north. Is that sort of making sense, the distinction between these vertical construction projects and horizontal construction projects? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so for this video, we're gonna focus on the vertical construction because that's primarily what people using Revit are going to be doing. And on vertical construction, what you'll have to do is define a conversion 
IFC calls it the map conversion. And this converts your local engineering coordinates where Project North is up the page and your small numbers that architects like to work with, where the origins in the bottom left corner or wherever your grid set out is, convert those local engineering coordinates to the eastings and northings used by the surveying discipline. So this is a conversion factor which will need to store correctly in your model. And the good news is that Revit does this almost out of the box. So for example, if I say that, okay, I finished designing my building, my job is done. And at some point you have a chat with the surveyor and you say, okay, this is my site boundary. I want my building to start over here. Hey, Mr. Surveyor, tell me my Eastings and Northings for that point. And all this should sound very familiar. All of you are doing this already. You say, hey, Mr. Surveyor, what's the Eastings and Northings of that? You know, where's my set out point? So I'm just gonna uncheck my survey point. You can see, by the way, right now it's, um, it's set to uh, zero, zero, zero. There's no data in there. And I'm just going to go into coordinates, specify coordinates at point. I'm gonna tab a couple times until on my bottom left, you can see it hits the, should get the project base point. Uh, sorry. There it is, project base point. And let's say the surveyor tells me some big number. For now, I'm, I'm not gonna put a huge number. I'm just gonna put this project a unit is in millimeters, so 10 meters and 20 meters. I'm gonna leave the elevation at zero and I'm not gonna touch the angle, just to keep things simple. Okay, so now if I go look at that, we can see that the coordinates at that point, the eastings and northings of that point, as the surveyor just told me, are those two numbers. If we press export one more time, now we're gonna pay attention to this setting here. We're gonna leave it as shared coordinates right now and I'll show you what happens. Lo and behold, you can see that the entire project has shifted to whatever coordinates that we just told it to be. And this is perfectly fine. And this is perfectly fine if you're doing a horizontal construction project because everything gets shifted out to where it is in the real world and using the Eastings and Northings, using the coordinate reference system that you've defined in your geolocation settings. But this is not quite right if you're dealing with a vertical construction project, because vertical construction projects work in local engineering coordinate settings. It works with the architect's intention to have a local false origin, a small set of numbers with a clearly defined project Y. When you say it's not a problem that it is shifting away from the 000, we need to keep in mind that for Revit, if you read such an IFC in Revit, this will be a problem if you will leave this 10 miles circle around the Revit origin. Correct. Due to the, the way the core has been written a long, long time ago. <laughs> we need to live with the fact that there is an uh, Revit internal origin, which cannot be moved and which defines an area with a 10 miles a circle around it where the geometry needs to stay inside. And if the geometry leaves this circle, then we get uh, some issues inside of Revit. But as you say, Absolutely. actually it is not an issue for the vertical buildings and so on, they are never larger than 10 miles, right? So what I'd like to highlight here is that in theory, what we've done here is is 100% correct from an IFC perspective. So forgetting for the moment that you can bring it back into Revit, if from a purely IFC perspective, it's technically correct. You know, the coordinates are exactly where they say they are. So far, just looking at Easting and the Northings, it's correct. But you're absolutely right. Revit is designed for vertical construction and bringing them back will have lots of issues. It will place it very, very far. And we will cover that when we bring it back to Revit later on. So yes, that's, that's another reason why this should be avoided. And it's not just Revit, which has this problem. It's most 3D software out there and 3D platforms, which have an issue of dealing with very, very large numbers. So the preferred solution to this is to, the objective is to get the IFC with the local origin, almost exactly as we see here in Revit. You know, that's what we want to achieve. So right now I have the project base point and the survey point and the internal origin all aligned. So if I change the setting from shared coordinates, it doesn't matter which one I pick. They're all gonna give me the same result in this scenario. Now. Of course, some projects, they aren't in the same spot. So what I would always recommend 
is to use the project-based point because the internal origin, as you said, cannot be changed very easily. And I don't like the survey point because I'll explain why later. <laughs> There's no such thing as a survey point in real surveying. There's many, many survey points. So what I would recommend is to use a project-based point. You'll see that number change. We'll hit export one more time and let's check the result. You can see that's come back right at this false origin. So this is a false origin of 00, zero which gets translated using the map conversion parameters of 10 meters in the eastings and 10 meters in the northings. So that sounds absolutely correct. We'll check that one more time. We'll say, okay, using our local coordinate system or 000, zero, zero convert that local coordinate system to the map coordinate system, which has resulted in exactly the eastings and northings that we expect so far.